Hello everyone and welcome back to The Beatles Forever. And as I mentioned in the other videos, I'm continuing to go on a Wings adventure thanks to the book Band on the Run. Well, the videos, they don't have to be watched in any kind of order and you can see each one and see what's going on in those years that the band was together at different time periods. <laughs> so this uh, video begins with the departure of Jimmy McCulloch. Well, Jimmy was frustrated at not having much to do when the band stopped touring during Linda's pregnancy. And uh, Jimmy decided to join a new Small Faces band, and he said that he was disappointed Wings didn't turn into a total band. I'm sure Paul knows, and everyone knows, that it can never be. As a touring band, it'll never be like other bands where you see the other members when you're not working. With Wings, it was get the work done and get home. So Jimmy left on a good note, and he said that they had good times together, and he was quoted as saying, though Linda doesn't know much about music, she's really a nice chick and I certainly learned a lot over the past two years. Well, prob Paul was probably used to getting the revolving door of band members leaving, which is why he never bothered with contracts, or maybe that's because they left because <laughs> they didn't have that contract. But he said it's just one of those things, and when you think about it, it's really difficult to set something like a stable group because in my position, you get all sorts of weird little problems that you can't do much about. He said there was tension between him and Jimmy, and they had to either work through it or just leave. And when Jimmy left, Joe English soon followed. And I've seen that happen in my work. Um, people started feeling dissatisfied and just felt it was a good time to leave. And once one person goes, the other people start to think, I guess it's good for me to leave too. So Joe wanted to be part of a real musical team, and he thought that Linda was pulling the band down. And he didn't really like Denny Lane, just like Jimmy didn't care for him. <laughs> So Joe was promised royalties, which never materialized, just as other band members had been told. Paul said that Joe left because he wanted to spend more time with his family in Georgia, and he'd been in England for four years. And Denny seemed to have a problem with band members who wanted to make money in the band. He said that Joe left because he had made some money and bought a house and got his Porsche. So Denny said the same thing about Jeff Britton, saying that he was only in it for the money, and how he kept saying, when I get my big house... And Denny said that Paul didn't like hearing talk like that. But I don't think there's anything wrong with having goals and dreams and and all of them wanted to be successful enough to get the finer things in life. And Joe had felt that way too. Mull of Kintyre. It was during this time that the band was down to three that Mull of Kintyre was made. So Paul and Denny collaborated on it. Paul had written the chorus of the, in the summer of 1976 and then put the song away for a year. And it was then that he showed it to Denny, and they completed the music and lyrics. The song became an unofficial anthem to Scotland with bagpipes and guitars. I remember I bought the 45, and I played that song to death. I loved the bagpipes and the feeling the song gave me. And it's funny that the source of inspiration of Mulligan Tire wasn't the greatest place to be in. <laughs> Denny said that the place had an old light lighthouse, a decrepit hotel, and a cemetery, and he wouldn't wish the place on his worst enemy. But Denny came up with the idea of the Campbelltown band to play the bagpipes on the record. Paul got together with the leader of the band, and the guy showed Paul the notes the bagpipe can play, so then Paul and Denny then rewrote wrote the song to incorporate the instrument. Well, Paul wasn't too concerned about the public's opinion of the song because he felt it was one of Wing's best songs, and a guy on the radio said at the time, There you go, Paul, keep him guessing, and Paul thought that was great. <laughs> Okay, the song became number one on all three major English charts, and Paul said it was a long time coming. Not only that, it became the first single in Britain to go double platinum, and it eventually sold more than 2.5 million copies in Britain alone. The previous bestseller in the United Kingdom was the Beatles' She Loves You, so how about that? So the song stayed on top of the UK charts for nine weeks, and I'm sure Paul was proud of that. In America, the record wasn't as successful. It failed to hit the top 100 in any of the U.S. charts. I bought my copy, Paul, <laughs> but it's a mystery to why it failed in the U.S. It said the DJs were playing the B-side at Rocker Girls School that hit the top 40 on the U.S. charts, but it was still a disappointment. Money once more became an issue with Wings when the Campbelltown bagpipers started to complain to the press. They were paid scale wages for their work, and they felt that their sound contributed greatly to the song, so Paul ended up giving $300 more to each band, each member of the band. London Town released. The album was released in the spring of 1978, and they had a major hit with their song, With a Little Luck. It hit number one in the U.S., 
and London Town, the album, stalled at number two for a month and a half in the U.S. charts. The record that kept him out of number one was the soundtrack Saturday Night Fever. Well, some fans were disappointed that Mullock and Tyre wasn't on the album, and that was because Paul didn't feel like having it on there. The record company had called him and said they were going to put it on the album, and Paul said, no, we're not. So then later he said it was his fault that uh, it didn't happen. <laughs> well, two new members were hired after London Town. Uh, the first was Lawrence Juber. He wanted to become a top studio musician. Denny saw him on the David Essex show, and he was the musical guest at the time. And Denny was asked if he wanted to jam with Denny and that Paul and Linda would be there too. And he said, yeah. He was 25 and he wanted to change a direction. He felt that it would help him further his music education. Sort of my master's at McCartney University, stated Lawrence. So these two band members, the next one that joined, I don't remember either one of them. So this is interesting to find out more about them. And the next member of the band was Steve Holly and he and Lawrence were both British, and he was a drummer. In March 1978, he was invited by a friend Denny Lane to play, and he began to jam with Wings on occasion. Next, he did a formal audition, and he had to wait a few hours for Paul and Linda to show up, and they played together for a long time. Uh, Paul liked what he heard, and he was in the group. Paul was asked later about the turnover rate being large, and Paul said, you think when you get a band, you can all be happy together and have chemistry. And he said it wasn't easy getting another band after the Beatles. He said there were arguments and stuff, but that was the nature of bands. Juber and Holly were offered $450 a week each, and usually a band of Wings Caliber earned uh, group members $2,500 a week. Juber and Holly didn't complain. They thought they could live comfortably on that. The next album was Back to the Egg. Uh, June 1978, they began work on the album. Paul wanted to go with a harder-sounding punk New Wave style. Juber said it was back to the basics, garage band kind of feel, and he and Holly had a great deal of freedom. Holly said that one time Linda told him he didn't, she didn't really want to be in the band. She would rather be with her family, but Paul liked her in the group because it made him feel more comfortable. Holly said that Paul was open to suggestions creatively, but there was a problem at the start. Before recording, recording Old Siam, Sir, Holly said he wrote one of the main riffs for the song, and he accused Denny Lane of borrowing it. So that's a good choice of words uh, <laughs> before Paul got there. So Holly and Lane both thought it up, they said, and they almost got into a fist fight over it, but Paul broke it up and he sided with Denny. It was around this time that Denny and his longtime girlfriend Jojo were married November 1978 on a boat outside of Marblehead near Boston. Paul and Linda didn't attend and didn't give their best wishes, so I wonder what was going on there because Paul and Linda had always gotten along so well with Denny, thinking of him as loyal and a friend, and they didn't give their best wishes. Hmm. Also, several weeks passed, and they finally sent a wedding gift, but they didn't give too much trouble. It was a pair of silk sheets and pillowcases, not gift wrap, but in a shopping bag with no card. So that didn't sound like they put much uh, thought into it. <laughs> EMI decided to release an album of Wing's greatest hits during the holidays, and Linda and Paul designed the cover themselves and Linda bought an Art Deco statuette of a woman with arms stretched out, and they decided that would go on the cover. And next, Paul decided which songs were going to go on the album. They had about 24 hits, but had to narrow the song list down to 12. So weird thoughts were put in for some of the songs on the album. Another Day was put on the album, even though it was released before Wings even started. The fans got the Mull of Guitar on the LP, but it didn't seem to make sense that it, the song wasn't a hit in the U.S. Uncle Albert and General Halsey was on it, even though the song was never released as a single in Britain. So that might be a good thing, though the British people could finally have a album with the song on it. Many of the fans thought that Helen Wheels and Maybe I'm Amazed should have been included. I think they're right there. And they also felt a remixed version of Venus and Mars should have been included because it wasn't on any Wings albums. And Listen to What the Man Said was excluded, which was a very popular song. And Sea Moon wasn't on it. And that's funny because I, I never heard that song until it was on Paul CD Amoeba gig. And I thought, wow, what a great song. This, that was the first time I'd ever heard it. <laughs> and also some felt that Mary Had a Little Lamb should have been there too because it was the top 10 in the United Kingdom. Well, the critics were split on the album. One critic, Robert Chris Gow of the Village Voice, called it Pop for Potheads. 
but Rolling Stone thought the album brought out the power of the single, and he felt the album was better than any individual album the group did except for Band on the Run, and I have to agree with him on that. The album sold more than one million copies in the U.S., which sounds pretty good, but EMI was hoping for better. That album completed Paul's contract, and he then went to CBS Records, who were the highest bidders. Band on the Run book stated that it was a great deal for Paul, but the worst deal CBS ever did. A former employee for CBS said it was too much money for an artist who was past his prime, and everyone who met Paul that day were starstruck, and they were buying a Beatle. So back to the egg disappoints. The band and CBS were disappointed with the sale of the album. Rolling Stone had asked Paul if Back to the Egg branched out into new areas, and Paul said slightly, he said, but then you go back to what is you, and it takes a certain mold. Columbia promoted the album heavily, but it didn't help. Back to the Egg peaked at the bottom half of the U.S. Top 10. The company became disillusioned with Paul, and he was the only major artist the company never had a welcoming party for. A former CBS executive said the records he delivered to us didn't help much. He came in with a fair hit with Good Night Tonight, but he refused to put it on Back to the Egg LP so they couldn't work with it. And then the executive said that he refused to bend because he was a Beatle. He didn't have to have us, but we really wanted him. So everyone in the band felt the album would be a success, but when the final mixing came in, doubts started to appear. Paul said later that it wasn't one of their better albums. And when Ask It Back to the Egg was a concept album, Paul joked it was a bomb sept. So the years of 1977 and 1978 had the band changing, even though everyone had hopes that they could remain together as a band. It seemed that Wings was forever re-involving themselves, which had to be hard to be creative in, and some wonders if Paul was too hands-on and didn't want to listen to people, but members of the band stated that he did listen but it might have had something to do with the chemistry and it's hard to gather a group together and have everyone get along with everyone in the band. So many things kept happening and people were feeling they weren't being used to the best of their abilities and it was easy to leave because there was no contract binding them. So I listened to my sister's Back to the Egg album and between the albums London Town and Back to the Egg, I would have to pick London Town. The album cover for Back to the Egg was the best thing about the album. So we're nearing the end of the book, Band on the Run, so hang in there. I have been enjoying reliving the Wings years and finding out things I didn't know before. So I hope everybody else has been enjoying the video. And if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would help the channel. And also be sure to click on the notification bell, and you'll be notified whenever a new video appears. And I hope everybody's been having a good day. And tune in again soon for another episode of The Beatles Forever. Thank you. Bye.